those of you uh, who have joined us before um, will know that um, I present this. Uh, my name is Lee Hancher. I am the director um, of the law area at the Foreign School of Regulation, together with my colleague, Adrian de Hautclock, who is head of um, the cabinet of the president of the general court and is also part-time professor with us at the FSR. Um, so he's extremely well placed um, to tell us what's going on. Um, so what we, we do is we look at the, the main cases that we think are of uh, relevance to the energy sector, the latest developments in the case law, and then we'll finish off um, with a list of pending cases, the ones to watch, which of course uh, we will deal with uh, once they're decided in our next installment um, of this regular event. So that will be towards the end of 2023. So I'd like to turn now to Adrian, who will present um, the first part of the overview. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be here with you today and uh, as we do uh, every six months now and uh, a lot a lot on is on our plate i will uh, start uh, with competition and um, then uh, i will uh, give you the floor back Lee. so i'm going to try to share a few slides It'll be easier for the audience to follow uh, once again And here we are. Is it well shared? I guess it is. So we start with competition uh, on the competition front. So um, 101, 102, and merger control. It's been very quiet lately. Uh, it's, it has not always been like that. It won't always been like that. But at the moment, uh, it's true that uh, it's not what's really uh, moving. So we had in particular one case uh, concerning merger control in Germany in the context of the asset swap between uh, E.ON and LWE. And so they, there are two waves of appeals. And so now we have the decision concerning the first wave. So just as a reminder, the asset swap is made of three interlinked operations. Uh, and on the one end, the first, the first operation, was LWE acquiring part of E.ON generation assets, in particular the nuclear assets. Uh, that's the uh, the first uh, the first um, uh, uh, let's say the first operation. The second is E.ON acquiring uh, certain uh, generation as assets uh, owned by Energy and some of the distribution and retail assets. And there we have also appeals because these two. Uh, let's say these two operations have been treated uh, separately by the European Commission. And so we have to separate uh, wave of appeals. But there's also a third operation, which is LWE taking 16% uh, of AON um, share holdings. And there was a decision of the Bundesgartenland. And so obviously there was a preliminary procedural question <laughs> It, was it correct to uh, treat these three packages uh, as different, let's say, operations, whereas everybody agrees that it's only one asset swap? And so there uh, it was uh, an interesting, I think, development. It's not related to energy in particular, but on the concept of single concentration. And there the general court um, uh, ruled in favor of the commission, saying that, of course, even if it, it had been discussed, discussed back in the days, in particular, when there were some revision of the regulatory framework, but an asset swap cannot be uh, single uh, concentration within the meaning of the major regulation because you don't have uh, uh, control, you, you, you have um, uh, here independent undertaking, so RW and EON controlling, taking control of different as, different, different, tar different targets. And that's not uh, a single concentration. And also the commission is bound by what has been submitted uh, by uh, the parties. And so I think interesting uh, development on the procedural front uh, on the concept of single concentration. What's more relevant for us is more the uh, substance 
uh, and there there was not uh, many, many, I think, takeaways uh, from these uh, 10 or 12 decisions. The first thing I think was concerning the relevant market, uh, because uh, there it was not disputed that it was Germany, both at the generation and at the retail level. But um, the question was whether uh, renewables, as they have, uh, of course, a specific regulatory frame, they should be an autonomous uh, relevant market. And the Commission said it was not the case. And the, the General Court ruled in favor of the Commission. So that's one thing. And the second thing, maybe a bit more new, was all the developments about uh, the possibility uh, of the new merge entity uh, controlled by RWE to abuse its dominant position in the Wilson market. And in particular, because there was no, it was, it didn't really create uh, higher market shares. Uh, so the dominance was in a way kind of the same. But we know that in, in, in electricity, of course, uh, you can abuse or you can, let's say, game a bit the market, even though you're not very dominant. And so there, there was a whole development about the residual supply index and how it's applied in, in, uh, in the electricity market. In particular, there was an interesting assessment about the, of the, pivot, the pivotal role uh, of uh, RWE in, um, the, um, in the Wilson market. But yeah, uh, the commission found that was confirmed by the court that uh, RWE was only pivotal for 5% uh, of the hours uh, of the year, and that was only temporary well, and um, on the, 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 the commission had also looked at the ability of RWE uh, to uh, withhold some of the capacities and so to have an impact uh, on uh, electricity also prices and um, in particular because of the new uh, renewable capacity but the commission con considered that uh, this uh, new capacity would not give the opportunity to, for RWE to easily do withholding because they are not easily controllable. And so that was uh, overall uh, backed uh, by the general court. And so all appeals in this first wave have been rejected. So now we'll get uh, the second wave of appeal. There has been a hearing uh, a few months ago uh, for the second op op operation, uh, so the one where Eon ac acquired uh, these energy assets and RWE distribution and retail assets, and so we we you have uh, some of course the procedural question is also raised again, but um, yeah we'll have the decisions somewhere difficult to know maybe end uh, of the year. Just wanted to mention the Polwax case; uh, it's uh, uh, also a major case, but it's in the oil sector. Uh, it's there's not really uh, anything to mention very interesting from an energy law perspective, but that was the appeal was uh, rejected, and so we were still uh, we're still waiting whether there's an appeal or not. Uh, I'm done, Lee, uh, as concerned the competition cases because there were only this one noticeable. Do you want to continue? Do you want me to go through the regulatory stuff? Lily? Hi, if you continue with the regulatory, I think it makes it easier. Okay, so, because it's, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit short. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll still do the, the snapshot uh, in the end, uh, obviously. So uh, I'm gonna share that again. Is it good? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so regulatory cases. So there I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, Taking, talking about the uh, cases concerning Acer because Lee will cover that in a minute. So here it's mostly uh, the uh, preliminary rulings with interpretation of uh, the, uh, the, um, the energy uh, and renewable framework. So here we have uh, a few cases uh, that I think should be mentioned today. Uh, the problem, the, the first one uh, is uh, uh, concerning priority access to the network for renewables. And in particular, what was interesting in that case is that the uh, producer was not a purely uh, renewable producer. Part of the electricity produced was 
uh, coming from uh, non-renewable sources. And so if when you have a producer that is doing uh, both renewable and non-renewable at the same time, uh, how do you uh, apply Article 16? Because in that particular case, the, the TSO, I think it was in Germany, curtailed uh, the um, uh, the uh, the power station because it was not uh, fully uh, f producing fully from renewable and so there the court was clear that priority access also applies uh, to this producer to producing both from renewable and conventional energy sources and what's more interesting <laughs> I think is that you they can enjoy. Uh, that priority access, but only up to the sole viable proportion of the electricity produced uh, out of renewables. And of course, and uh, that uh, raises uh, some issues because in the end, how is that possible? How can you know, as uh, being the TSO in real time, uh, how, I mean, how, where the, uh, how the electricity has been, um, has been uh, produced? So, Fortunately, uh, the court took that uh, into account and said that it's up to the member states, of course, to find a way uh, to give priority access to these yeah, mixed renewable producers. And that it doesn't have to be for every single time, for every single hour, every single yeah, hour of the year. It can be as long as it's ensured over a sufficiently long and a representative period of time, and as long as it's technically feasible. And so there has been a temperament to the general rule that Article 16 to applies to these producers. And so the member state must define criteria, uh, non-discriminatory, of course, transparent. And most important, the court uh, said that the reliability and safety of the system is very, very important. So I think the main uh, out uh, uh, the main the main uh, point from the case is that of course you enjoy as this kind of mixed renewable producer priority access. However, you'll get it eventually over a sufficiently wide period of time, and if it doesn't uh, jeopardize system security. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, I almost uh, yeah, hesitated to mention it, so I'll be, I'll be very, very clear, uh, very, very short story. Here is really, uh, it's, it's, so it's a case in Italy where the regulators went after Green Network, uh, which is a retailer in electricity and gas, because this retailer, there were complaints from customers, was not transparent on its prices. In particular, there was an administrative management fee that was yeah, kind of hidden somewhere uh, within the terms. And uh, it was not really clear what, was the, what the price was. And so, uh, and like that, of course, uh, the Green Network enjoyed some sort of advantage over its competitors who were more transparent. And so the question was, uh, can the, uh, the regulatory authority go after an operator that is doing that, or that is not really lying on anything regarding the quality of supply, but more on uh, the transparency of its tariff, uh, because the, uh, the authority imposed a fine on that undertaking and ordered repayment for something like 15 million euros. And so, yeah, the court ruled that, uh, of course, uh, the regulator can go after such a, such a company having such a, such a conduct and can order, so national law can foresee that the regulator can uh, force the company to um, uh, uh, repay the customers when, there has the, uh, the, the, when that undertaking was in breach of the obligation relating, uh, relating to tra tariff transparency. So um, another one, I think this one may be more important or interesting at least, was um, concerning uh, the monopoly uh, over uh, for, yeah, the um, uh, the fact that there was only one operator uh, legally allowed uh, to provide NEMO services in 
in Bulgaria, so the nominated electricity market operators, so those who are operating not only uh, not only national but also market coupling services in their head, intraday, and forward all the markets, and there was um, a legal monopoly granted to Upcom, and Upcom, as far as I know, uh, had also. Uh, troubles of, uh, with, with the commission for uh, 101 and maybe also 102 infringements. And so in this, in this case, there was another operator that wanted to also be a NEMO. And so the argument was, yeah, but the electricity cross-border regulation is there uh, to uh, push for, to make sure that there is competition in all the markets. So how is it possible that someone has a national legal legal, legal monopoly uh, for the provision of the services? And so uh, the, the, the court said that, yeah, it was possible uh, to have a legal monopoly uh, for these activities. Of course, uh, the, reg the cost border regulation uh, is there to encourage competition on the electricity markets, obviously, but there's no explicit provision uh, preventing that kind of monopoly. Um, it recalled that it's not because you hold the dominant position, which of course you have uh, when you have a legal, uh, legal monopoly. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily incompatible with, with Article 102, so the abuse of dominance provisions, to have such a dominant position because you've been given a special rights and you still need an abuse uh, for, it, uh, to be, uh, for, that, for, for it to be a problem. Um, so, an interesting thing, I think, it's that the court still had a fairly, I think, legalistic uh, analysis of this because, for example, it didn't really went into the substance of can it be good for competition to have only one Nemo? Uh, because, of course, if you have several platforms where everything's traded, maybe it can have an impact also uh, on the intensity of competition. Uh, and so maybe in a way, I guess it's, it could be argued also it's good uh, for competition to have only one Nemo. But then, Anyway, on that particular case, uh, so the, the, the court ruled that there was no problem. Also, it's because it's foreseen uh, by the, uh, the uh, capacity allocation congestion management guidelines, uh, it's possible to have one national monopoly as long as it pre-existed uh, at the time of entry of the guidelines. It's possible to have only one. You have to notify it to the commission, and the commission can take necessary actions after a few years and so uh, in that particular case the commission didn't do anything and so we didn't see it as a problem uh, the court saw also that even if it was not raised there was maybe a problem with the free movement of services and establishment and uh, asked uh, and said that the, the the national court i mean could use uh, could look at it uh, if it found that the situation was not purely internal, which probably was not, as it seemed that Nemo was in charge of market coupling. So anyway, possible to have one uh, legal monopoly for uh, your Nemo, in particular if it pre-existed a certain date, and not a problem in itself, at least. Uh, that's what come out from that case. I think I'm almost done. Yeah, I'm done already on this regulatory case. So this time I will hand you back the floor, Lee, and I'll do the snapshot later. Thank you. So let me take over then. Um, I hope you can see my screen OK. Um, yeah. So I want to, first of all, um, look at some recent state aid cases. Um, these cases have uh, dealt with these three issues. Um, the usual old chestnut, what are state resources? Um, there's been quite an interesting case on who is an interested party. And then there is um, a very important um, case on the rules on what we call accumulation. So adding subsidies or state aids that are considered compatible together to um, work out whether when you add them all up, um, are they still indeed a compatible aid? So state resources. Um, I've added a case actually, uh, which came out um, just the other week um, after we published uh, the list um, on the web, on the FSR website. So this is a, um, a new case um, concerning uh, car hire companies in Barcelona. Um, and it's a bit reminiscent of a, a black taxi cab case in the UK. Um, 
uh, over a decade ago. Um, and it raises the issue that comes back quite often in European state aid law as to whether or not regulatory measures, uh, which do uh, possibly confer an advantage on one group of companies as opposed to another, um, could that be state aid? Now, those of you who maybe know state aid law um, quite well will probably recall that the courts have been very careful about getting into this area um, because it would mean that if regulatory measures um, that confer advantages um, were also state aid without more, then this would be uh, hugely problematic because every type of regulation would obviously have to be notified and cleared. So the courts have always uh, taken great care to avoid that outcome. Um, now, in this case, um, the Barcelona um, municipal authorities had adopted a measure according to which <clears throat> already licensed car hire companies were required actually to obtain a second license um, before they could legally provide services in the city. Um, and they were the aim was to to cut back the number of licenses um, operating in Barcelona, and the authorities claimed that this measure was necessary to reduce pollution and congestion in the city and to maintain the viability of normal taxi services. Um, so uh, the, there was no link to, sto to state resources. There was no burden on the state here or on the municipality of uh, Barcelona. So the court um, didn't really have any problem in um, rejecting uh, that um, that argument that there was a state aid here, even although, of course, certain players um, clearly would be uh, um, given an advantage. Um, note, of course, um, just because it wasn't contrary to the state aid rules, um, it didn't mean that other treaty rules here, um, Article 49 of the treaty, um, could have been breached. So that's always another another angle. Um, that parties can explore, but state aid, it was not. So moving on now um, to the next slide. Um, this case, um, a, a Latvian case, and I'm afraid uh, the name is rather uh, difficult to pronounce, so I'll stick to the numbers, they're joint cases. Um, this is an important case. It has many facets. Um, I can only cover a little bit of it here. Um, but it, it's a, one of these cases which comes then from uh, the national courts here, the Latvian courts. Um, the amount of money is, is rather small, but it raises um, some interesting points of principle. Um, the dispute that reached the Latvian courts concerned alleged loss of revenue, um, which resulted from um, a regulatory price being fixed to, um, at too low a rate of electricity purchased by a distribution company in Latvia from the Latvian producers of electricity. And the producers of renewable electricity claimed that the energy regulator had um, failed to fix a correct price for renewable energy, and they demanded compensation uh, for damage. So compensation uh, for, the, for the, their loss of income. Uh, however, the damages that they claim corresponded to the difference between the price paid to the applicants by the distributor and the price at which the latter was supposed to have purchased electricity from them. So the higher proper regulatory price. Now, the sums involved were very low. Uh, they were, in fact, you could say de minimis. They were 3,500 per, um, per order. So the, um, the companies in question, these electricity companies, were obliged to, to purchase from small um, hydroelectric plants their surplus electricity for a period of eight years that should have been at a price that was higher than the market price in a certain period. So there was an obligation on these distribution companies um, to pay then the producers an above price, above market price. So um, what did the court rule? Sorry, I have to go back. Sorry, the court, first of all, looked at the surcharge or the levy. And again, this is an area in which there has been quite a lot of uh, case law. And that case law is not always um, very clear, especially since um, Germany uh, versus the Commission. 
uh, from three, four years ago, uh, where certain tariffs um, or levies in tariffs were actually, to everyone's great surprise, not considered to be state aid. Um, so here, um, the court picks up on the distinction um, that has been made in that earlier case law to recall that um, when you're looking at state aid um, in the form of surcharges uh, imposed by energy companies on um, their uh, users or on, in this case, uh, distribution companies purchasing from producers, um, then it's important to see, of course, whether that's imputable to the state. Uh, and then you have to look to see whether the funds are either financed by a levy or a compulsory charge under national legislation, and then are managed and apportioned in accordance with that legislation. And if that is the case, that will be then um, a state resource uh, because the monies are under the control of the state. However, and that's not the only um, way to identify a state resource, you have to also look at whether the sums remain under public control and therefore they remain available to the competent national authorities. So the fact that what's very important then is whether the, the, the sums that are charged, um, even if they're not technically a compulsory surcharge or a levy, um, but they're still channeled uh, to um, a public entity or a state entity and remain under that entity's control, then they can be categorized as state resources. And in this case, the funds resulting from the surcharge in question were collected, managed, and apportioned by a company wholly owned by the member state concerned, and they couldn't be uh, used for any other purposes. So they were earmarked uh, for a specific purpose, and that was to offset the additional costs um, that had to be paid uh, to the producers of uh, renewable electricity. So this public control test then um, is, is highlighted in, in this Latvian case um, and uh, will in some ways, I think, serve to clarify the ongoing discussion after the German uh, tariff case. Um, another issue in this case um, that is quite interesting is whether or not um, this claim for damages or compensation in damages uh, could be a state aid or not. And the court um, recognized that there are, of course, um, cases where damages can be awarded. Um, um, and that will not necessarily amount to, to state aid. So where um, a, a state authority has acted um, in a way that causes it to be liable to a party and it is, um, it is liable to pay compensation under national law, um, it, that doesn't automatically mean that the measure in question is a state aid. However, and the court emphasizes just because national law would not classify the compensation um, as a form of state aid, that does not mean that Article 107 might not be relevant. So if the national legislation at issue is itself um, established as a state aid, then the payment of any sums claimed before the national court in accordance with that legislation will be a state aid. So here, as we've seen, um, the levy involved um, a state aid. The right sums had not been properly paid out. The correct sums had not been cor correctly paid out. And therefore, um, the legislation was a form of state aid. And that means, of course, that uh, before payments are made, there are notification obligations, unless, of course, the aid is um, an existing aid, and that was also an issue um, in this case, and that in turn also raised the question of whether if it was new aid, um, did it also constitute de minimis aid, which did not have to be cleared. So these, these were intricate questions that are also dealt with um, in this case. So this was, this was an important um, ruling uh, in many respects. Um, and the court issue, I should also add, um, 
that um, another issue that's been um, quite um, uh, sort of hot potato in state aid law is whether or not um, state aid can arise from a judicial decision. And here the court seems to hold that that's not the case. Um, the establishment, that decision entails a decision as to the appropriate course of action, and that falls outside the scope of the powers and obligations of the court. So it's, um, it, it's it, it, again, this case has many facets and is worth having um, a close look at. Let me now turn um, to the question of um, interest, the definition of an interested party. And this is quite an unusual case uh, because it concerns um, a trade union um, who sought the annulment of a commission decision, which had rejected its complaint against a state aid measure in France that had been authorized, um, but um, the, the trade unions uh, wanted um, to um, have that measure annulled because it adversely affected their, the number of employees uh, in the um, French electricity company EDF. Um, so the commission had rejected um, the um, complaint, the trade union's initial complaint, uh, because it claimed that um, the trade union was not, sorry, we go back, an interested party within the meaning of um, Article 1 of Regulation 215. Uh, that is, um, and 1589, that's the so-called procedural regulation. So the, the court looked carefully at this definition of an interested party and concluded um, that it covered um, a potentially wide um, number of types of parties. Um, it wasn't just um, a question of showing that you were a competitor to the recipient of the aid. So it doesn't... Um, the, the, that concept doesn't even presuppose um, any kind of competitive relationship, but you still have to show um, that there is a link um, to the harm that you would suffer from the aid in question. And in this case, um, the alleged harm to the interests of the union had no direct or any certain link with the aid measure. Um, and it seems that the reduction in the staff at EDF didn't result from the aid measure as such, but from a decision of the company, a quite autonomous decision. So that um, uh, was a, quite an interesting um, case, but really one that confirmed um, the existing approach to the definition uh, or the scope um, of the so-called interested party. Now, turning now um, to um, the last of the state aid cases that I want to talk about um, is an important case, as I mentioned, on cumulation. And this case concerned a, a German operator who um, was exporting biogas um, from Germany um, into Sweden. Um, now, what had happened here was that um, many member states actually give various forms of tax relief to producers of biogas, um, but those are usually, of course, um, producers located in their own member state. And given that um, many forms of green energy um, cross national borders, they can pick up various forms of relief on the way. And in the case of biogas, uh, this is not unusual. This case concerned um, tax relief that was granted um, in, in Denmark. Um, but that was su subsequently not taken into account uh, by the Swedish authorities. But there are many other similar uh, cases, I believe, uh, where where this um, has been happening. Mm -hmm. um, the members, the the commission the commission had um, found that the Swedish aid uh, question was compatible. It didn't um, consider that it had to look at um, the issue of tax relief outside. Uh, the Swedish um, territory. So the fact that the, 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 the biogas had received aid somewhere else um, was not considered relevant. Um, and therefore the commission closed um, the um, inquiry um, into the complaint um, and also um, closed then um, its investigation um, adopting a positive decision without opening uh, the formal procedure. Um, so this was challenged uh, by Landfarm, the um, 
the biogas manufacturer or producer, um, and the court agreed with the land farm that, that there was, a, as there was a high risk of um, accumulation, um, then it was important then um, to take into account the the the, the impact of tax relief um, so that um, the imported energy wouldn't receive an unfair, um, would not receive an unfair um, advantage. And this of course um, raised a, a rather complicated um, interplay with the treaty tax rules, the rules on indirect taxes in Article 110, uh, which prohibit discriminatory tax treatment. And there the court had to look at the implications of whether or not um, by get granting um, the imported energy, also tax relief, uh, if that would be um, um, a, a disadvantage, a discriminatory uh, as a discriminatory tax. And you'll see there, sorry, that the, the court actually finds that there is no discrimination because there are two very different um, products. So and treat different products differently uh, because that is objectively justified. So as I say, this is a, an important case um, and will, I think, also um, be a, an important precedent for um, cases on green certificates and guarantees of origin uh, to the extent that some of those um, are not always surrendered uh, when uh, the goods in question are exported from one territory to the next. So there are uh, risks of double or triple um, compensation through state aid as renewable energy crosses numbers a number of borders. So moving then on to the institutional part, um, and we have here a number of cases um, uh, with uh, uh, where there are um, brought against Acer, so um, before the General Court and the Court of Justice. So um, the first one um, to mention is um, APG and others, the Austrian Bar Company and others. Um, and this is um, a decision from March this year, uh, which has now been appealed. Uh, so that should be on the, 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 the pending list that Adrian will uh, take up. And uh, this case is an interesting case because like the BNETs uh, case we discussed uh, the last time around, uh, it deals with the limits of ACER's competence to um, issue terms, conditions, and methodologies. The, the so-called frameworks uh, in this case um, for um, frequency restoration reserve platforms under the um, electricity balancing guidelines. So these, these measures are, you could say, um, below delegation. ACER um, has um, powers in uh, the guidelines themselves, in the EBGL, for example, uh, to adopt a decision addressed to the GSOs um, in certain circumstances. Um, now, th this case occurred um, before the 2019 regulation took effect. Um, so the... Um, the, the relevant terms and conditions were negotiated uh, between all the TSOs and the NRAs at that time. Now, of course, um, it's the uh, these these types of uh, frameworks or guidelines where all uh, European TSOs are involved and all European NRAs are involved. They, in fact, go directly to Acer. But before 2019. Um, this was not the case, and it was only where all TSOs and all NRAs uh, could not reach a decision that um, it was um, the case would be sent to Acer. Now, in this particular case, the NRAs had been able uh, to decide on a lot of um, the issues. There were two rather technical things that they couldn't decide upon, uh, so the matter was referred to, to Acer. But Acer decided to take a new decision on, on a number of issues um, that there had been some agreement between the TSOs and the NRAs already. And in particular, Acer um, took a, just a new, in, in its decisions, or in fact, two decisions on these restoration reserve platforms, one on automatic and one on manual. And um, Acer considered uh, that 
the, the governance rules um, in the um, electricity balancing guidelines had not been properly um, applied uh, in the um, so-called non-paper by the NRAs. When the NRAs sent uh, the request to ACER to make a decision, uh, it was accompanied by a non-paper which set out where uh, the NRAs were in agreement and where they were not. So ACER um, was of the view that the TSOs um, actually had to set up either a, sep a separate entity or a consortia of TSOs to manage um, these platforms. So they couldn't just nominate one of a particular TSO um, as a sort of agent to run these platform functions for them. And importantly, um, ACER also decided that a particular function, the so-called capacity management function, um, also had to be transferred to these platforms um, in accordance with the governance rules um, set out in the electricity balancing guidelines. Um, and that was something that had not been discussed uh, between the TSOs and the NRAs at the earlier stage. So this was uh, why then um, the TSOs um, challenged the decision. However, the general court upheld ACER's decision and in particular, and following on largely uh, from that earlier BNETS, um, BNETS A ruling, the uh, court held that ACER derives its competence to act on these TCMs and to determine their legality um, from the recast ACER regulation of 2019, which extends ACER's powers in this respect. Um, so that um, was sufficient then for the court to rebut all the arguments that ACER um, had no competence to depart from what the NRAs had previously agreed. Secondly, um, another um, big issue in this case was the scope of judicial review. Um, the, the Board uh, of Appeal in the decision um, had um, applied the case law that was um, at the time um, valid, if you like, uh, because the, there was a pending case, which I'll come back to, which had not yet been decided. Um, and the board um, claimed that ACER was not um, required to exercise a full judicial review, but a so-called marginal judicial review was all that was required. Um, however, um, Although the um, TSOs um, appealed that point, the general court said, well, looking at the case, um, it seems that the board has, um, in fact, de facto exercised a full judicial review. So the board said one thing, but it did something else. And in fact, um, it, 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 it subjected uh, ACER's decision to a full judicial review. Now, on that point, um, the, um, the applicants have appealed to um, the Court of Justice, as well as on um, the issue of whether this capacity management function uh, should be something that um, has to be um, managed by the platforms. So that um, is um, an important case I want to watch. As I mentioned, in the meantime, before, well, the, before the Board of Appeal, gave its uh, decision in um, the APG case, um, the courts uh, were looking at the very question of the scope of review. And um, the Akron case, uh, which was also handed down in March, um, ruled um, there the, the European Court of Justice upheld the general court's ruling, uh, as well as confirming the opinion of its advocate general, that the boards of appeal um, of agencies like ACER must conduct a full review. So not just a marginal review, limited to errors of law and uh, manifest errors of assessment. Um, so a full blown review. And ACER's arguments um, to the effect that a board only has very limited resources, uh, they don't have a separate staff, they have a very limited budget, and they have to um, adopt their decisions within a very quick time frame, and uh, does not put them in a position of carrying out a full review. Some boards, uh, it was pointed out, do actually have 
um, almost uh, a full-time board membership, um, and they have better resources. But the court says, no, um, that uh, sort of argument doesn't count. The board is required to conduct a full review. Um, interestingly, Acer had also argued that the board had, in fact, uh, in that Akron case, which concerned uh, the interconnector between France and the UK, or a planned inter interconnector, um, Acer argued that, in fact, the board had carried out a full review, uh, but the, the court rejected that um, in um, no short terms. Um, so um, the de facto review argument does not look as if it uh, could be very successful, but we will see uh, now that that will be replayed in the APG case. Um, Acer, of course, um, and the Ackwind case is a bit of a long-running saga and has given rise to quite a few um, cases before the board and also uh, before uh, the, the general court. Um, and um, one of the, uh, the problems, of course, for the um, company operating the interconnector Ackwind um, is that um, it connects to um, what is now a third country. Uh, so that's the UK. Um, and there um, it has been held uh, that um, following Brexit, then um, neither Acer nor the Board of Appeal can take a decision um, to follow up uh, the earlier case law um, of uh, the general court, um, which had annulled um, Acer's decision. Uh, refusing the exemption uh, from various regulatory requirements to the Aquint interconnector. So although um, Aquint had won its case and, and it was held that Acer should not have denied the exemption, uh, by the time um, that um, case went back to the Board of Appeal, it was, as it were, too late because following Brexit, Acer and its board were no longer competent. So um, there's another case, uh, which is also worth worthy of mention, concerning Aquind, um, and that um, is an appeal this time, um, not uh, against a uh, an Acer decision, but against a decision of the Commission. And this is quite an important um, ruling because um, it um, shows that the court um, is very keen uh, to uphold the division of competences between uh, the Commission and Member States when it comes to energy matters. Um, this, I'll just very quickly mention that this case concerned um, whether or not um, the interconnector should have stayed on the so-called PCI list, Project of uh, Common Interest. Um, France took it off. It, uh, France doubted that the project uh, should have that status. Um, and the question was, could the Commission then overrule France's decision? Um, the court finds that it can't. The Commission uh, cannot um, reinsert a project back on the list that the member state there has the first call. So that, um, I think, winds um, up the uh, quick review of Agment and all uh, the cases that it spawned. I was told the other day that Akrind is intending to sue Acer for damages. So that will be another novel case. I don't think that case is yet registered. Um, but let's turn now to the pending cases, the selected pending cases. Adrian. Thank you, Leah. I'm going to, to share again. Uh, if we stop, yeah. OK, so. Yep. All right. So, okay. So this section, of course, is always a bit of a difficult one because uh, there are, of course, pending cases. So uh, we don't really uh, go so much into the discussion of these cases, but it's interesting to see a bit, let's say, what's in the pipe and to try to map uh, a bit uh, all what's on our docket. And the more it goes, because we have doing this this case law update for a few years now, the bigger that section is. So I'll try to um, to uh, make it uh, not too long, 
um, and stay within the, the, the five or so minutes I have. So what's really maybe the more the burning uh, issues, if so of course the case is linked to the crisis. So there, I think you have two elements. One is uh, the appeals uh, introduced against the council measures uh, of end of last year. Uh, and they are, of course, they are very interesting. And um, one uh, is against uh, the regulation 22, 1854 on uh, price intervention. There, uh, basically, companies, and not only companies, uh, but, yeah, companies yeah, contest the use of Article 122 uh, as a, a legal basis of adopt for adopting these measures. And of course, uh, this is Article 122, it's for, it's, it's for crisis, but these measures must be temporary in particular. And so, yeah, so there's, it's really, these cases really are primarily uh, on, a con on the issue of the legal basis. And for us, it's very, very uh, interesting, uh, of course, uh, to see to what extent uh, it's possible to use that legal basis to implement that kind of measures, because of course, they go, uh, they go very far in particular, all uh, the, the let's say maybe not tax, but uh, like uh, all the measures to get some of the profit some of these actors made. So um, we have one, two, three, four, five, I could find at the moment on regulation 2022, uh, on, sorry, 1854, on 1319 on quality demand reduction. This one is very interesting because it's been introduced by Poland. And uh, Poland is uh, is uh, is very unhappy. There are different pleas raised. It's not only uh, the use of Article One to Two. It's also about the interpretation of the principle of solidarity uh, on legal uh, legal uh, legal certainty and the margin of, ma of maneuver of the institutions. Uh, to uh, define when we are in an alert uh, in alert mode. Uh, so when we are really in crisis mode, which of course triggers uh, a lot of uh, the measures that are in the regulation. So there's uh, there's a there's a third. Uh, uh, but there's another case, the NMAC case, which is very different because it concerns the gas joint purchasing, purchasing scheme. And there it's more about um, uh, how uh, the bids were made to be able to be the platform uh, for aggregating demand. And so uh, this is a bit more particular, but it's still there. And there was an interim measures uh, required. and. Um, and so we don't have that many appeals uh, in the end concerning this these emergency measures but the issues particular on the use of the legal basis uh, on the on the use of article 1 to 2 is 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 particularly interesting so that's one aspect and the other aspect is what happened at national level uh, under stated rules and uh, how the commission cleared some of the national schemes that were implemented by national authorities to go through the crisis. So we have two at the moment, uh, one concerning Spain, the other concerning Germany. And I mean, unsurprisingly, it uh, revolves around the issues of, okay, um, uh, these measures give an unfair advantage to my competitor because I can't get some of the money or I'm financing the mechanism but I don't enjoy uh, its benefits and so uh, that's uh, um, that's around this issue so that's first the uh, cases concerning the management of uh, the crisis then uh, what's coming our way are the cases concerning uh, not the taxonomy itself but uh, the uh, two delegated regulations adopted after uh, the taxonomy uh, on the basis of the taxonomy so this delegated regulation define the uh, technical criteria uh, which um, allow us to define whether an activity is sustainable 
and uh, and conducive to uh, tackling the climate change challenge. And so you have two regulation, uh, one, the 20, 2021, 2139, so the first one on the slide, which is general. And the second one, the 1214, concerns nuclear and, uh, and, um, and natural gas. Uh, the, uh, the, the non-renewable uh, natural gas. And so in the first one, it's only um, uh, NGOs uh, that contest that, but in the second one, there's Austria, uh, of course, that has a problem with nuclear. So um, these are very interesting cases. Um, the Second one concerning the, the first delegated regulation introduced by Fédération Environnement Durable is based on the Aarhus regulation mainly. Uh, so and we'll see a bit more of that uh, coming uh, coming forward uh, because they asked the Commission to to revise uh, its decision. Uh, but when it adopted the delegated regulation, the Commission refused and then they introduced uh, an annulment proceeding on that basis. So as concerned the second delegated regulation, we have already two decisions. Uh, I mentioned them there because they're very, very short. ATPN uh, is, uh, is an NGO and Repassi is uh, a member, uh, an individual member uh, of the European Parliament. And his argument, or well, both uh, cases uh, were rejected as inadmissible, but his argument was that the, uh, the Commission was incompetent uh, to adopt this delegated regulation. And so he went forward to ascertain uh, the right of the Parliament and in a way its own right too. So inter interesting, uh, rare. Um, in uh, in um, uh, so the, the Greenpeace and Client Hearse uh, in these cases are very active. Uh, you can see they are a bit, uh, are a bit everywhere. Um, and so this is where, uh, in these two cases, plus the one with Austria, that we will have really the big discussion uh, on, the, uh, on the delegated regulation uh, defining nuclear as uh, sustainable. So I just wanted to mention that we had the opinion of the Advocate General in the BEI uh, client Earth case, uh, which is um, about um, uh, the conditions for getting a review uh, from decisions and deliberations from the EIB when they decide to finance a project. Uh, the General Court had um, uh, um, agreed with client hers. So uh, the fact that the EIB couldn't refuse to, uh, to re-examine its decision. And the, uh, uh, the Advocate General Cockart, in, his, in our opinion, uh, sided with the, with the General Court. So we will see what the, what the, what the, what the court will say, but uh, more and more uh, we are seeing uh, cases concerning uh, the uh, application of the Aarhus uh, regulation, which I think is an inter interesting development. On the SA cases, uh, um, I'm not going to say much. Actually, we have more and more. So some get closed. So we talked about it. We get new ones uh, lately from RWE and Uniper. Uh, like a few a few months ago, I think uh, you see there on the second bullet point the appeal. Uh, from the cases uh, Lee uh, just discussed. I think what's interesting to see uh, is that uh, we probably get a bit off the way some of the more the constitutional issue or uh, the institutional issue, for example, on the scope of review of ACER. And now we get more, we get more into the technical uh, of the um, of the of the decisions, and so the earrings the earrings gets uh, get longer and longer, and uh, it gets really more technical. And so no, that's interesting. So this uh, stream uh, of case law is definitely uh, is definitely flourishing. So then on the regulatory front, um, there are many. Uh, as usual, uh, references from national courts. So um, I can't go through all of them. Um, they have, of course, different phase uh, sometimes. 
just by order, so it's not really worth discussing. I I'm, I spotted two, which seemed interesting. One on the powers and the independence of, of the regulators uh, in Finland, and one on uh, who uh, has uh, to constitute minimum oil stocks, because we are also I mean, building stocks, uh, of course, in particular in natural gas. And so I'm wondering whether we'll find some interesting things in this in this case. Um, of course, there's the Nord Stream 2 case uh, that is back uh, from the Court of Justice. Uh, Nord Stream was uh, contesting um uh, the gas uh, the amendments to the gas directive and uh, it was considered inadmissible uh, the appeal by the general court but the uh, the, the general court judgment got uh, quashed by the court of justice so now it's back you know? so uh, it's still uh, it's still pending um yeah i wanted to mention this uh, this uh, little stream uh, very new uh, concerning the national climate plans. So these, um, um, these are NGOs um, who are um, appealing uh, the treatment by the European Commission of these national climate plans. Um, in particular, the fact that the Commission endorsed, so you have the, the Dutch one, uh, the uh, Swedish one, I think also, and um, uh, in short, this NGO think these climate plans are not ambitious enough. You know? And so uh, they try to, uh, to, to contest that uh, they are enough uh, in the end uh, at the EU level, uh, using not only, uh, but uh, using the, the Aarhus regulation again, so asking the, the European Commission uh, to re-examine um, you have uh, some pleas based on failure to act, uh, of course, from the Commission. Uh, but you have different things. Um, so let's see uh, if they can fly. But uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, so and it and it's new. And I think to finish, because I think, yeah, and just to finish, so the competition stated stuff. So competition, uh, but still very short. We have uh, the Fali Olna 2019 BEH case, uh, which would get, uh, which should get close to the end now. So it's 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 in Bulgaria. It's a, uh, it's a 102 case um, where uh, there's a problem of some, some sort of, as far as I can remember, constructive uh, refusal to deal and the problem with access to the network. And so I think it's interesting. Then you have the second wave uh, of um, uh, appeals against uh, the Commission decision regarding the EON RW asset swap. So I talked about that in the beginning. So this, I think, probably by the end of the year. Um, on the state aid front, um, we have um, uh, a bit some of the oldies. Uh, the Covestro has been there for, for a while, so it's the, the German case concerning exemption uh, from network charges. Um, there are a lot of cases linked to that particular case uh, that are stayed and pending before the general court. And so I think uh, once we get the decision from the Court of Justice on that Covestro case, then uh, the, all, all the other cases will come alive. Uh, so we have, of course, uh, the case concerning uh, the Hungarian nuclear, uh, uh, where uh, Austria appealed uh, the ruling of the General Court. Uh, and we have different support schemes, um, cogeneration in Germany, uh, support scheme to biogas. Uh, but this one we discussed now, it shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. Uh, and, and this one uh, should be there, is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> where we got the opinion from the Advocate General lately uh, concerning um, someone uh, uh, having a problem with the EU ETS uh, stated guidelines. Uh, so you see uh, a lot, a lot of cases, less competition stated that uh, back in the days, uh, a lot of the NGOs uh, are very, very active. Uh, more on the Aarhus Convention uh, for the Aarhus Regulation. Um, and I think that's it, Lee, on my side.
Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we've run on a little bit, I'm afraid, uh, beyond the allotted time. Uh, there was a question, would we um, circulate the slides? They will be um, available uh, on the website. Um, I think we just have to make a couple of small corrections uh, and then we will circulate the, uh, the um, okay. we'll join the, the two presentations together and uh, we'll make them available um, uh, very soon. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, attending. And um, I apologize that we had a lot to talk about and there wasn't much room for, for questions. Maybe we have to extend these sessions a little bit longer uh, in the future. Um, but we will be back um, in uh, the fall, in the, the fall. And um, I hope uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Have a wonderful summer. Before I go, I'd just like to thank the staff at the Florence School of Regulation for um, helping us uh, put the presentation together, to Max, especially Max Munchmeyer, and also um, to the, the media support staff at the Foreign School. So have a wonderful summer and thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you, Lee.